All right, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'd like to welcome all of you who are watching and following along with this edition of the Virginia Sports Hall of Fame's Hall Call interview series. I am Will Driscoll, as always, here all day and every day, uh, the executive director of the Virginia Sports Hall of Fame, hoping everyone continues to stay safe, stay healthy, and do your part as we hopefully are looking at the end of the pandemic. Um, there's a little bit of light at the end of the tunnel there, um, but we're just hopefully everybody's doing their part, stay safe, stay healthy. And, uh, and hopefully we're, uh, we're gonna have a good interview today. As you can see on our screen, we are joined today by Larry Legrand. Larry Legrand is from Roanoke, Virginia. And uh, Larry has a great story to tell and I'll kind of preface it with a little bit of, of backstory. Uh, from the early to mid 20th century, the Negro Leagues of Professional Baseball offered black players a chance to play professionally when Major League Baseball would not. Uh, history has shown that many Hall of Fame level talents plied their trade in the Negro Leagues when opportunities elsewhere were non-existent. As integration took hold in Major League Baseball in the late 40s through the 50s and 60s, the Negro Leagues began to be phased out and their stories left to be told by those who played. Larry Legrand is one of those people who played in the Negro Leagues. Uh, as I mentioned, he's a Roanoke native. He spent his time in the Negro Leagues with the Memphis Red Sox, Detroit Stars, and Kansas City Monarchs in the late 50s. And uh, in, in his own words, he had the most accurate arm in the league at the time. Um, Larry, you, you went on to play with the Yankees as well and, and ultimately ended your career with the Satchel Page All-Stars. I just want to say thank you for taking the time out to join us today. We're really looking forward to this conversation. And uh, again, thank you for joining us today. Thanks for having me. So Larry has shared his story in a 2018 biography, I Found Someone to Play With, and today he shares it with us. And before we get started, I would like to also thank 2015 Hall of Fame inductee Mike Stevens for helping us coordinate uh, this interview. So thank you to Mike on that. Obviously, this, as, as usual, is up on our Facebook Live. So if you have any questions, please feel free to chime in. Um, I, I, I'll kind of start with a, a pretty simple question. Uh, it may be simple, it may be a loaded answer, but Larry, when you look back on your time uh, in the Negro Leagues, what did that time mean to you? That time meant to me was to go play where Jack and Robinson was playing. And that was to the major leagues. I also wanted to play first in the Negro League because they had a, a newspaper called the Afro American. And I would walk the road and find soda bottles and get two cents deposit and sell them to buy the paper with. Off of Henry Street in Rono, I am from Pinkett's Court on the outskirts of Rono. And that's how I read about Buck Leonard, who was one of the greatest offensive or defensively baseball players who ever played the game. He was from Rocky Mountain, North Carolina. He had a 390 lifetime batting average. Satchel Page, and of course, Jocks Gibson. Just to name a few, Larry Doby, Monty Irvin, Oscar Charleston, who could twist the cover off of baseball. Great, great baseball players, and Martin Diego, who they claim was the greatest baseball player who ever played the game. Just to name a few. Well, you, you know, you you put out you put out a lot of names there, and there's obviously a lot of names that you know baseball historians and sports fans have learned about over the course of over the course of you know the last 50, 60 years uh, since the Negro League dissolved. Um, we're getting to a point, though, where there aren't many of you left. Um, I think Bob, Negro Leagues of Baseball Museum President Bob Kendrick estimates there's just over, I think, 100 living players that can say that they, that they played um, in the Negro Leagues. How often do you see or talk to any of your contemporaries? About twice a week. I talk with quite a few of them. So what, what, are the, what do those conversations entail? talk about the racism we went through during our time. We talk about the games we played against each other and and the fun we had and me catching Satchel Page and playing right field. And one thing he told me, save everything you can about us. When you tell people you play with me, they won't believe you anyway because I'm so much older than you. 
he was right about that. I never saw so many people wanting to talk to me about Satchel Page. So that's why I wore my jersey. And I got letters from Satchel telling me when spring training was starting in Kansas City. And it's amazing that at, at what has taken place. Well, he was... You know, and, and again, baseball fans and historians may know this, but, but for the the person who doesn't, he was a 48 year old rookie in Major League Baseball before he finally got his opportunity to play in the majors. Um, but you know, legend the the stories are legendary of of his just ability on the mound. You said you got the chance to catch him. What made him so special? Here's what made him so special. I, everywhere I go, I tell people. If you look today, these pitchers throw 100, 102, 103 miles per hour. But guess what? They throw the ball down the heart of the plate. Old as I am now, I could hit that once I get some time. You know what I tell them? Get a video and watch Greg Maddox pitch on the corner, on the corner. Satchel Page had the greatest control like Greg Maddox today. Of course, he just started throwing strikes his last four years in baseball because he was getting a little up in age and he was missing the mark. Other than that, Greg Maddox is the closest I've seen come to Satchel Page. He's in the Hall of Fame in Cooperstown. If Larry Legrand is stepping into the batter's box against Satchel Page, what is your approach? Look for the ball on the outside corner because he told me, guess what, Larry? I don't know whether you're catching or playing right field. You're just as dangerous. He said, but you know, I don't pitch inside anymore. I said, I know you don't, Satchel. I look for him to pitch me on the outside corner, and I learned that through the great Lorenzo Piper Davis, who was Willie Mays manager for the Birmingham Black Barons. He taught me, just because you're a little guy that's strong, I got that from working on the mini farm in my, in my neighborhood. He said, I want you to hit the ball where it's pitched. If it's outside, hit it to left field. And I started hitting the ball at the ballpark to left field. And you know who remind me of myself? This boy that played for Atlanta Braves named Acuna Jr. Ronald Acuna Jr., yeah. You better believe that. Well, right. I think he'd be proud to have your name associated with him. You got that right. <laughs> Acuna Jr. Well, yeah. you know, I kind of I kind of want to go back. You mentioned growing up in Roanoke. Um, I, I've, I haven't read the full uh, auto, the full biography uh, that, that you wrote. I found someone to play with, but I have started reading it. And and there was a really funny anecdote at, kind of at the beginning of the book. Your father worked in the railroad industry, but he also had a side gig. And that was running moonshine in Franklin County. That's right. And you and your brother were actually kind of helpers, if you will. Kind of give us a little yeah. insight into that. <laughs> well... When he would go, he'd get suitcase, and they fill it up with six half a gallons, and he'd have us to put our feet on top of it. And like we were going on a joy ride, and the police would pass, and back then the police throw his hand up, and he throw his hand up. Well, they just on a joy ride, but we had six half a gallons of moonshine liquor that he was bringing back to his house to sell to his neighbors. <laughs> but yeah, you and your brother were decoys. Yes, that's right. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, it's nice that you were able to help out there on the, the side business. That's um, right. Growing up in Southwest Virginia during the 40s and 50s, I can't imagine there were a lot of opportunities for you to play baseball. How, how did you fall in love with the sport, and what were those opportunities for you to get out on the field? Well, my baseball career, like I told you, started from reading the Afro-American mm -hmm. newspaper. They had a baseball team. It was called the Pinkett's Court Wolves. It was owned by a man named Mr. Thomas Whitfield. 
he owned a, a restaurant in Salem and one in our neighborhood on 220 South. I would chase foul balls when they played on Saturday or Sunday. And my brother started me out in our parents' front yard. I'm being a left-handed hitter. He was a left-handed pitcher. And he learned me because I would shy away from a left-handed pitcher. That's how I learned to hit left-handed pitcher. So that went on for some time until I would go to the field. But also, we had to do farm work, whole beans, whole potatoes, clean the chicken house, clean the hog pen. And I asked him later on after we were grown, Daddy, why did you give us that much work to do? He said, I know you couldn't do it. He said, I just want to keep you out of trouble. He said, I don't want you here. I don't want, I want you here when I come from work. But I ignored that. I went to the field to, to play. And believe me, when I got home, meet me on the back porch in your undershorts. And we had several trees on the property, and he would wear us out completely. But I didn't mind that. I had been to the field to practice, and that went on for some time. And when practice started, they kept the balls, the gloves, the bats, breast protectors, shin guards, and, and, a, and a big army buff, duffer bag. So they emptied it out, and ever who didn't show up for practice, I would grab that person's glove and go out on the field. And one day, I stabbed a line drive. And they said, look at that. Other words, I was called bad words that I won't mention to you. <laughs> get off of the field before you get hit your look so and so. But I didn't mind that. So now, Thomas Whitfield, he decided he didn't want the team anymore. So there was a team in Blue Ridge called the Webster's All-Stars. So the players from the Pinkerscoat Bulls said, let's go to Blue Ridge and see if we can hook on with them. Said, well, what about Lyre? Said, yeah, we got to take Lyre. So they took me and we went down there and asked the man if we could join the team. Now, we didn't have uniforms. But we we had blue jeans and a sweatshirt and all. To the man that that worked for Webster Brick Company, someone asked him to ask the owner of the Webster Brick if he would get us uniforms and put Webster Brick on them, which would bring them more business. The owner agreed to that, and we got uniforms. And here's what happened there. Two weeks later, the uniforms were in a big box. When we went there, I said, uh-oh, I know what they are. That must be the uniforms. But still, I'm a little skeptical about whether or not I'm going to get one of these uniforms. I'm 14 years old. These guys were 10 to 15 years older than me. Two were 21 years old. So you're a teenager playing I'm 14. with grown men. Yes, I'm 14 now. He passed out the uniforms to everybody. The people across the street looked like to me. But anyway, when I looked down in the box, there were two jerseys and two pair of pants. I had them separated now. When he reached down in the box, I followed him down like that. When he looked up, I looked him straight in the face. I was telling him, if you don't hand me a jersey, I'm going to choke you to death right now. <laughs> he handed me a jersey. When he looked down in the pants and box, he handed me a pair of pants. You could see me grinning right today. So when I got home, my, my mom said, look, look low. My dad was named low. Look low. Larry got a uniform. I was 32 in the waist and the pants were 36. My mama took took a sewing machine and sewed them up on each side and had them to fit me. And my jersey number went down inside my pants. 
So I didn't mind that as long as I had a uniform. And that went on to one day. I was a junior. First of all, the Little League for Blacks didn't exist. Yeah. My school didn't have a baseball team to offer. The Memphis Red Sox and the Birmingham Black Barons played a game at Municipal Stadium. They were dining on Water Street, I believe it was, at May's Inn, which was Tom Whitfield's restaurant as well. The manager come out of the restaurant on the bus looking for something. When he got off, this man was passing by. May he rest in peace. If it hadn't been for him, I don't know. And Mr. Chauncey D. Harmon, the principal at Carver, where I went to school, he asked him if he knew of any black baseball player. He said, I know of one. Said his name was Larry LeGrand. He said, can you get in touch with him? He said, sure. We had, we had just gotten a telephone two weeks. And you know, they put your, your number in the phone book right away. So he, he called me and told me to come to the game tonight. Now the Birmingham Black Brown was the team that Willie Mays played for. Mm -hmm. So I went to the stadium, municipal field rather, and I asked for Homer Curry. He was the manager for the Memphis Red Sox. I'm a junior in high school. And he asked me if I wanted to come to spring training next year. I told him I would. So I never thought no more about it, but I did. So the next, the next year, it was time for, I went to the mailbox, it was time for spring training, and I got this letter in the mail, and it's from him. And he asked me to come to Memphis, Tennessee. Well, I don't know how in the world I'm going to Memphis, and I'm a senior now. So what I did was ask my principal, Mr. Chauncey D. Harmon, may his soul rest in peace, if he saved me from that. If it hadn't been for him, I can't go to Memphis. He said, see your homeroom teacher. He said, you can go, but you have to learn your class play and your lessons assignment. Well, I didn't care too much about the lesson assignment. <laughs> I got to go to Memphis and make his baseball <laughs> thing. When I got when I got on the train, my father retired, you know, from the North and Western Railway. That train backed up and stopped and let passenger trains through and freight trains and pulling and backing up. I killed two chickens. My mother put one down in another bag. When I got to Memphis, I had a leg and a chicken bag and a half a biscuit. Well, you, it, it's amazing just hearing hearing you kind of recount how you got into baseball and then your ultimate start in professional baseball. I love baseball stories like that. They always kind of engender this emotion and you can see your, the emotion that's still there with you that's and right. how that makes you happy. But you know, let's, let's talk about your start in professional baseball. You're playing baseball, but it, it was not easy. I mean, you, you know, the Negro leagues was not the majors. Um, there were a lot of challenges that you and your teammates faced, both at home and on the road. And, and I'll even kind of reference a story you said as a fan when you were a young fan. You used to love going to watch the, the, the Red Sox minor league team in Roanoke. That's right. You weren't allowed to sit in the stadium. You had to sit outside on the hill. Left field in the bleachers when it rained. We had to sit in the rain. White people sat up under the, the roof. So, so as you begin playing, are the, these challenges are still there, even though now you're the player. Just kind of talk to us about some of the challenges that you faced as the player in the Negro Leagues. Well, first of all, when we, when we did play, we had to sell our crowd. If we had 10 to 15,000 people, we got paid for 8000 And from the experience, 
we could tell how many people were in the, in the stands. The owners would send tickets to the promoter. He'd sell his own tickets, and when we got there, he'd give his tickets back for credit for having having sold about 2,000 tickets. And we plan on 60 40%. And we got paid for like 20%. Mm -hmm. We had 32,000 people in Old Griffith Stadium in Washington, D.C. We got paid for 16. We played a triple header that Sunday. And every Negro League team that passed through that play a triple header. The first game starts at 11 o'clock. That's in Griffith Stadium. The next one was in Baltimore. That started at 3 o'clock. We playing seven inning games because we got to get on with it now. Just a trip mm -hmm. ahead. And the third game was in Philadelphia. And we got cheated. For every game we played in, we got cheated. But let me tell you who we had on our team. We had on the Memphis Red Sox team, that's the first team I played for, right? We had this guy on there who thought he could sing. Did he ever? We didn't want to hear that country music. We, we, we can't stand white people. <laughs> and white people can't stand black people. And we tried to get Randy's record mark from Gallatin, Tennessee. He played blues music. This guy kept singing and singing, Lord have mercy, did we hate that. He had a great knuckleball, he was a good pitcher, he could hit. Come to find out this pitcher thought he could sing and did he ever. He did it well enough to sell over 31 million, over 31 singers and sold over 70 million albums. And you know who that is, that's Charlie Pride. Country Music Hall of Famer, Charlie Brown. I, I was his catcher. He'll go down in history as one of country music's all-time greats. You formed a great that. relationship with him. It, it, wasn't, yes. it, it didn't I just happen. You guys played baseball. I talked with him. Yeah. I talked with him. Up until passing recently. But three yeah. weeks. Three weeks before he passed. Mm -hmm. He asked me how I was doing. I told him fine. I said, I, you know, I get the country western station on, on TV. I told him about it. I'll see you singing on that. And he laughed <laughs> like that. I asked him how was Rosine doing. That's his wife. She's knitting for the grandchildren. I said, you know what you did? We call him Pride. I said, Pride, you know what you did, man? You broke Elvis Presley's record. You had 54,000 people out there at the Houston Astrodome. He said, Larry. He said, when I went to you, I had over a million people. I said, what? He said, yeah, man. I, I said, well, that's not surprising. You, you're great. And we all are proud of you. And we talk about it when we talk to each other on the phone and how surprised we were to hear he had passed. And that's about that's about it for Memphis. So now, the next year, I asked the manager at the All Star Game. Is always played at Kaminsky Park in Chicago, home of the Chicago White Sox. I'm in the stands. Here comes the man that owned the Detroit Stars and the Kansas City Monarchs. He had to change that, so he put the Detroit Stars in his niece's name because one person can't own two teams. I asked him if I could have a tryout. He said, I would. I know who you are. Why come you're not out there? I said, well, I don't know. He said, well, give me your phone number. I'll call you. He did call me. He sent me a bus ticket to come to Birmingham, Alabama for spring training. I went to Birmingham about a week later. Here come the meanest white man I know. His name is Bull Carter. He's a police chief in Birmingham, Alabama. Everybody in the United States knows him. 
or heard of them. He come up the steps with all those German shepherds and the police. We were three teams. Kansas City Monarchs, Detroit Stars, Birmingham Black Band players who lived out of town from Cuba and Puerto Rico. We had our baseball bats and we told him who we were, so immediately they left. Well, when they went out on the streets, they went to beating heads out there with those billet sticks. When we went out there, across the, went over across the street, they got in their vehicles and left. But the thing about being with Detroit, I made that team. We had an announcement. The manager announced that Satchel Page would be coming to pitch. And Reese Goose Tatum, the clown prince of basketball, he would be joining us. And they think it's Sweetwater Clifton, who was the first black to play for the New York Knickerbockers. So now we got three three stars and once the tv and the newspaper got that everywhere we played the ball park in fact they were in trees goose tatum was the first baseman for the indianapolis clowns before he started basketball he was the greatest hook shot artist that ever lived when we had rain out here called they here called the city and asked if they would open up their auditoriums so that we could practice basketball. He practiced his hook shot. He hit 25 straight from the corner out at the key. Well, how, back, are you, how are you as a basketball player? Back over his head. Well, guess what? <laughs> I played on a championship basketball team at Carver. I made the third team and I got a chance to play. But I was a first stringer in football. Yeah. Yeah. So the next year, we had Satchel Page and Goose Tatum again. And here come all of these scouts. I don't know from there. Minnesota Twins, Cleveland Indians, Milwaukee Braves. And I didn't know of the other teams. But they would all ask about me because when I threw from right field, they say hit your cutoff man in the chest. That's too high for me. I could throw it above belt high. See, the cutoff man can handle that. And the thing about me, I could throw it on the money. If you hit him chest high, it'll be chest high when you get to the base. That's too high. You got to throw it down there. You follow me? I, I follow. <laughs> the good Lord gave me that. I brag about that. The, so they they took a liking to me, and one after we played in Griffith Stadium second time, my the owner called me to the to the to the dugout. He said, "Larry, come to the dressing room." I don't know what the devil does he want with me now. What did I do? Of course, you know. Traveling like that, there's a whole lot of people, you know what I'm talking about, that that we liked. I put it that way. Now, I don't know what I've done, but I don't know whether they're going to find me or not. But he said, come on, let's get on the elevator and go upstairs. When I got on the elevator, we went upstairs, and here were these two men at, at this plush desk. First time I ever saw carpet on the side of a wall, it was at the Washington Senator's main office. They introduced themselves to me. Hi, Larry. I said, fine. He said, we from the New York Yankees. We want to sign you. Sign me? I didn't know what to say. I was spared by it. Well, so, so what was that moment like? I mean, you know, here, here you are, you know, integration. Jackie Robinson had, had uh, Jackie Robinson had opened the door about 12 years prior That's to that. Right. That's right. But now here you are with that opportunity to, to at least have the chance to, to work your way up into the majors. What did that mean to you at that moment? 
it meant what I what I what what meant to me was reading that Afro American newspaper. That's what took it you meant all the way to back. Me. Took you all the way back to the beginning. All the way back, just that instant. All the way back, and what we had gone through in the Negro leagues. That hey, I'm going to play where Elson Howard was. He played for the Kansas City Monarchs, so I want to play with him. And you actually, you were doing very, very well in the minor league system for the Yankees. You actually Man. led the minors in hitting one year. Man, and, look, and, I was and hitting. You thought, you thought you were going to get the call up to the Yankees. You got that right. I was hitting 304, leading the league and runs bad to the end, third in the league and triples. And my manager called me. We, we beat, I don't know who that team was, but my manager called me and said, <laughs> Said, come in the office. I want to see you a minute. He called me in the office and said, I got instructions to release you. I said, you must be talking about somebody else. You can't be talking about me. I had a double and a triple. We win the ball game, right? You, you, you got to be talking about somebody else. When he told me that, I just couldn't believe that. I hated the Yankees. I hated white people. I hated black people. But I loved God. Man, I was spellbound. Mm -hmm. They said, well, see, so yeah, you have plane ticket to Roanoke. You can pick it up. I said, no. I said, I'd rather catch the train. So I caught the train, and the train stopped in New Orleans. And I got off and walked over to where we stopped when we played in the Negro Leagues. And then and the owner of the restaurant, he recognized me, and I had dinner there. And I told them my story, and I tell you, it was a sad time for me. But when I got back to Roanoke, the phone rang. It was Satcha Page on the phone. I couldn't believe that. And that's a great that's segue the biggest to the jersey. Surprise. It's a huh? great segue to the jersey that you have on right now. Yeah, the phone rang. Now I'm tell you, I grinned from ear to ear. He said, Larry, he said, I already heard about that. So what the age is wrong with them people? I said, I don't know, Satch. He said, I'll tell you what. He said, come to Kansas City. He said, I want you to catch, play right field. We need that arm, we need your back. He said, I want you to call the players. He said, these bunch of guys I got said, they'll be gone when you get here. He said, I don't know who sent them to me, but they can't play for me. He said, you know me. <laughs> He said, you know me, God gave me the ability. He said, you know the ball players I'm looking for. I said, I know that. Now, if you're talking about good, we we had to be good to play for him. Mm -hmm. You hear me? You talking about the Yankees, you talking about the Dodgers, you had to be better than them to play with him. You hear me? I want you to hear that good. That was his word. You hear me? And uh, that 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 year was a beautiful year and the most fun I ever had. We played in all provinces of Canada. We went to every state just about look like in this country. We went up to Anchorage, Alaska. That's beautiful country, and you know I'm There's a lot of there. traveling. It sounds like that's what I'm talking about. And the fans asked us, where you play last night? I said, I don't know. <laughs> I can't remember. I can't remember. Well, well talk about that final year or a couple of years in baseball where you, you've now transitioned out. You, you had the opportunity with the Yankees. It did not go how you wanted. But you were able to end your, your playing career with the Satchel Page All-Stars. And you're now the last remaining member of the Satchel Page All-Stars. 
what made that group unique? You just told us that you had to have talent to be on that group, but beyond the talent, what made the Satchel Page All-Stars unique? What made them unique? Mm -hmm. They all had class. They were class player because he was a class man. He stayed sharp, wore suits, beautiful king toe shoes, and people coming from miles around. We played in Greenwood, Mississippi. I have nothing bad at that time to say about the Klan. Check on 50 Klan who travel from miles. They said, we come to see you guys play in such a page pitch. And we stood and signed autographs for them for an hour. Satchel said, we got to go now. We got to travel to Jackson, Mississippi because we have a game now to play. But all of all of his players, you can come there being a thief. You can can come there being a, a roughneck because he was one of the he he was the first baseball player in the encyclopedia. Mm -hmm. So you 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 got to think about that. You you clearly are a just a treasure trove of memories and. Last year, the Negro League celebrated their 100th anniversary. Now, as with many things, the, the celebration didn't go the way we wanted it to. You couldn't really do a lot in person, but you were a part of a couple virtual programs and celebrations. You know, now that it's been over 50 years since the last official Negro League game, has the story of the Negro Leagues been effectively told? Somewhat. Somewhat. What, would you what would you change about it? What I changed about it was that money. The money is what I would change because we didn't get paid very much. And they were able to pay us. We had cheaters like promoters taking the money. Is that what you're speaking about? Well, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, that that's a, That's a great thing that you're talking about because you're speaking from your experience. I was asking that the original question was, has the story been told? And you said somewhat. And so I was asking about how, how you would have changed how the story is being told of the Negro Leagues. Well, they didn't tell the racism that we've been through. Mm -hmm. Now, Dr. King was having meetings with President Kennedy about integration. Some hotels let us stay, some put us out in the middle of the night. In Saxton, Missouri, the Chamber of Commerce booked us into that city and we beat the local team 18 to two. And when we got back to the hotel, they put us out. Now black people was just as bad we travel 75 miles. When we find the railroad tracks, black people live across the tracks. When we get there, it's daybreak, we get into this restaurant. This lady come out and said, don't pay any attention to that sign. Sausage, eggs, and grits, 26 cents. She said, that's, seven, that's a dollar and 75 cents. We got $2 a day for meal money. But when everything was on the level, that was enough money. I signed for $200 a month. And my, my biggest was $250. Mm -hmm. And I got cheated out of $50 of that. So it's it was crookedness. Well, there's there's obviously a lot of a lot of things, and you can definitely tell in talking to you um, and and listening to others that that played in the Negro Leagues and some who you probably played with, talking about it. They enjoyed the baseball part, but there are obviously a lot of things that that could have been and should have been done differently. Um, I'll get you out of here on this last question. You know, last year Major League Baseball did make the announcement that statistics from the Negro Leagues would now be reclassified as Major League statistics. When you heard that news, what did you make of it? 
I said, they don't know what they're talking about. The Negro Leagues didn't close until 60. When I played, there were six teams. That's why we had to play local teams to make up a schedule. And we played the East and West game where it was played since 1920 in Kaminsky Park in Chicago. That's my gripe. Why I closed it in 48 when it didn't close until 60? What's the difference? See, back then they had several teams back then. I can understand that. But that's not right. Yeah, and what you're referencing is the fact that they're only counting the statistics from 1920 to 1948, correct? Yes, yes. Well, let's get you out of here on a, on a good note then. I, I see you have your, your Carver jersey behind you. I see you're wearing your Satchel Page All-Stars jersey. You talked about having the most accurate arm in, in the league. You know, what, what is the fondest memory that you had from your time playing baseball? Was being, being playing my first game in the East and West game in Chicago. My manager, Ed Steele, he played right field, Willie Mays played center, Jim Zapp played left field. That was a, they won the World Series. I heard my manager say, hi, Jackie, and shook his hand, and Jackie said, I haven't seen you in years and years, and they hugged each other. When I looked around, it was Jackie Robinson. He came to our dugout. And my manager introduced me to him, and I shook his hand. That was the most firmest handshake uh, I ever shook. And I met him again in Kansas City when we had two All-Star games that year. That was in 58. And it was a pleasure meeting Jackie Robinson. I met Larry Dover. You know, after Jackie Robinson, Branch Ricketts signed Jackie Robinson, a month later came Larry Dobit with the Cleveland Indians. Actually, Larry Dobit broke the color barrier in 46 when he sent him to Montreal, Triple A. So I'll actually follow up on, on that, on my last question with this question. Did, was there a shared characteristic that Dobie and Robinson had they obviously you know they, they had to be tough you know had to have a thick skin and tough minded to to make those sacrifices but was there a shared characteristic that the two of them had yes very much so they they were picked on the all-star team they loved each other that's first mm -hmm. they talked to each other wrote each other letters they called each other when they could they both were great ball players. But now, one thing I wanted to tell you, I'm, I'm going to jump back to Satchel Page. You know when the Cleveland Indians signed him? He had to pitch against the Cleveland Indians baseball team. He gave up a scratch singer to Lou Boudreau, the manager. That was the only hit he gave up. <laughs> that was his tryout. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was his tryout. He shut him out. <laughs> he I think we beat, can find a spot for you. <laughs> he beat Virgil Trucks, who was a star pitcher for the for the Chicago White Sox. He beat Virgil Trucks two to nothing in twelve innings. He was an old man then. Yeah, the battles can do nothing with him. That's why when I was catching on the corner, on the corner. See these guys today. They throw the ball 100 miles, they overthrow. Just done, just watch it. They bounce the ball out in front of the plate three or four feet because they overthrow. They catch a whole target on the corner, they throw it down the heart of the plate. Am I right or wrong? You're, you're right. Sure. Well, I, I, enjoy, I enjoyed hearing you say, I think the thing that I'm going to take away, among many things, is that no matter what, 100 miles an hour, even at your age, if it's straight down the middle, you'll be able to catch up to it. Sure. Timing is all it is. A baseball player is a baseball player. 
Sure. Well, well Larry, I, I want to say that it's truly been a pleasure catching up with you today and uh, taking a look back at your career, the challenges you overcame, and some of the successes that you had. And uh, I just want to say thank you. You certainly have a story to tell. I'm happy to be a part of that. And you know, I got several more things to say. We might have to turn this into a series. <laughs> <laughs> No, but I, I know that at that time is up and is in. Uh, I enjoy talking with you, and it's, it's my pleasure, and it's just fun. I do this all the time. Well, we're we're glad you took some time out for us today. Uh, for those who were watching, and we had quite a few people chime in saying how much they enjoyed it today on Facebook. Larry does have a book. Uh, it can be found anywhere books are sold. It's called "I Found Someone to Play With." I've started reading it. I haven't gotten through it yet, but I'm really looking forward to finishing it. Tell them, uh, get, it get it from me. Get it from Larry. <laughs> that, yeah, anywhere books from me. Sold, including Larry LeGrand. <laughs> get it from me. <laughs> I'd, I'd like to thank everyone who tuned in today. As always, I'd like to thank our partners, the City of Virginia Beach, Priority Automotive, Optima Health, Davcon Inc., and ESPN Radio 94.1, as well as the Hampton Road Sports Commission. Be sure to follow the Hall of Fame on all of our social platforms, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, at VA Sports HOF. This video will be on the website and the social platforms. Once again, I'm Will Driscoll uh, with the Virginia Sports Hall of Fame. And uh, whatever you do, participate, don't spectate, and stay safe out there.